So I guess we'll get started. Uh, my name's Reed. Um, I work for a company called Digital Bond Labs, and I'm going to be talking about vulnerability inheritance in programmable logic controllers. And if you don't know what a programmable logic controller is, go check out the uh, ICS Village. It's down in Bronze 1, I think, down at the end of the hall. This way, it's the last, uh, last door down there. Um, so about our company, uh, we're a new division of Digital Bond. Digital Bond is a, a small consulting company that's been doing industrial control system and SCADA security consulting since about 2001. Um, our little part of, uh, of Digital Bond is focused on uh, working with vendors and some end users trying to find new vulnerabilities in industrial control systems so that we can you know, mitigate those vulnerabilities. Uh, I'm really biased because I do that for a profession. I'm really a big advocate of red teaming products. Um, so what am I going to talk about today? Uh, I'm going to be talking about vulnerabilities and what they are. And it's sad that I have to define that, but um, there's a, a group uh, that does uh, industrial control system security disclosure that has an unfortunate definition of the term. Um, and then we'll be talking about some uh, third party libraries in the industrial space and look at some, some cool vulnerabilities that live in those libraries and what vendors are doing to not fix problems. Um, so a vulnerability is really weird. Um, so ICS CERT, uh, they're the ICS Computer Emergency Response Team. They're a group that's run by the Idaho National Labs. Um, they're kind of like a, a government organization that discloses vulnerabilities in industrial systems and they put out these advisories and they put out these newsletters. Um, a few years ago they made this weird statement saying that um, they weren't going to consider design issues security vulnerabilities. So if something had like no security in its design or if it had a poor design that wasn't securable, they weren't going to consider the device vulnerable. Um, it was only going to be software bugs that were considered vulnerabilities. So a lot of us kind of fought back against that and they've kind of relented but never officially. Um, we get them to publish advisories for design bugs all the time now. but. Uh, they still never officially changed their position. Um, my definition, of course, of a vulnerability is any mechanism that lets you uh, change a system or modify it to do something that the operator doesn't intend it to do. Um, so that includes uh, kind of traditional bugs, um, like bypassing authentication, parsing errors, that kind of stuff, but also includes these design issues where things are insecure by design. Um, so let's look at some cool third-party libraries. Um, well, what is a third-party library? Um, anything that runs on, well, I, I specifically focus on embedded systems. Anything that runs on your system is really a third-party library, right? There are operating systems. There are these uh, common servers that usually live on industrial controllers. Uh, there was just a talk in here uh, at the last session talking about, you know, looking at some embedded systems that have, uh, you know, like an SSH backdoor. So like the SSH server would be a, you know, third-party library, I guess, but really a server uh, sitting on that, that uh, system. Uh, I'm looking in particular at industrial ones, and so two that I have focused on uh, in the last couple of years have been this uh, Codasys library and Prokonos library for industrial controllers. Um, Yeah, so we'll skip over that because that's more important to vendors. Um, so Codasys is a ladder logic runtime, right? So these industrial controllers are little computers that sit there and they monitor sensors and they make decisions based on what they're seeing. They say, oh, when the temperature's too high, we need to open up the coolant valve or, or what have you. Um, so these little industrial PLCs are used by all these ICS vendors. Um, the Codasys library is a thing that sits on a PLC and actually executes ladder logic and it does a bunch of other stuff too. Um, they're primarily used in Europe right now, um, but we do see a few of them at least in the US. There's uh, a couple of Japanese vendors that have started making these things with the Codasys runtime inside of them. Um, so here's a couple of vendors. Uh, when we initially disclosed issues in the uh, Codasys library, 3S Software, who are the makers of Codasys, used to have this list of all of their clients on it that had like 300 industrial control systems vendors. Um, they took that down when the advisory came out, um, I guess so that you know, people wouldn't know who the affected controllers were. Um, but luckily you can go on archive.org and look at an old version of their website and you know, grab that complete list still because the internet never forgets. Um, some of these are names that you might recognize because like Mitsubishi is like kind of a household name, so is Bosch, right? Um, some of these are more well known in the industrial space. Um, so Codasys, uh, like I said, it's, it's a lot of stuff, right? So there's a, a ladder logic runtime which is executing the logic for the PLC 
right? So that's, that sits on the controller itself. Um, that runs on top of a lot of embedded operating systems, you know, VxWorks, Windows CE, Linux, there's an RTOS called Nucleus, there's a bunch of others that we found. Um, so it executes the ladder logic, right? Um, and it also runs a small listening service uh, for communications so that uh, you can connect uh, a PC to pull the PLC and say, hey, what's going on? How is the process working? Uh, are things going okay? Um, and also for uploading and downloading the actual uh, logic that the PLC is going to be executing. So the, uh, Code Assist is also a piece of engineering workstation software. So this is like a visual studio for programming an industrial process, right? You get to drag and drop little software components to say, oh, if this input gets to be too high, then open this valve, you know, if this output uh, is like this and this input is like this, then do this other thing. You get to define all that stuff uh, in one of these programming languages. And the Codasys uh, engineering software, like I say, it looks a lot like Visual Studio if you're a programmer. Um, in addition to that, they also have this thing called an OPC server. OPC is like another protocol. It's kind of a universal protocol for industrial processes. It stands for OLE for process control. Uh, if you program, if you do much programming with Microsoft stuff, you might have some familiarity with, with uh, OLE um, from like doing Excel sheets and Excel formulas and that kind of stuff, and it's the same thing. Um, then there's a, a gateway service that's optional that uh, can sit between the engineering workstation and the PLC and can do all kinds of weird stuff. Um, so here are the main components of the Codasys like network, I guess you'd call it, right? So the PLC is that black box at the top, and then you have all these services that can talk to the PLC, and some of these services can talk to each other. Um, and usually when these services are talking to each other, they're also using the same Codasys protocol that, that we looked at. Um, so there are a couple of versions of the Codasys protocol, which makes things a little bit even more complicated. There's a version 2 uh, protocol, which is a, a part of Codasys v2.3 and v2.4. Um, we did some analysis of that back in 2012. Uh, it didn't take very long. Uh, and then we also looked at the version 3 protocol, which changed a lot of stuff. Uh, we did some analysis of that in uh, 2014 developed a couple of internal attack tools that we haven't released publicly. The, the version 2 stuff we've released publicly and it's all out there and you can grab it and you can even search Shodan and I'll show you how to do that. Um, the protocol changed a lot though. Um, so let's look at the Codasys version 2 flaws. So first of all, there's no authentication on uploading new ladder logic. So you can actually change a factory's recipe for making whatever it is it makes without providing a username and password. Um, so that's pretty bad. Um, then there's a little command line uh, that, it, that uh, lives as part of this service that you can actually uh, run a few commands via sort of like a command line interface, but it's actually packed binary. Um, but yeah, you can interface with the PLC and issue it commands and like, you know, there's even a help command built into it so you can say like, hey, what can you actually do on this command line? Um, then there's uh, the ability to start and stop the, the uh, PLC from even operating without authentication. There's uh, ability to retrieve files. So normally the file retrieval and upload is for uploading and retrieving the current uh, ladder logic from the PLC, but there's a directory traversal vulnerability in the server, so you can actually grab any file off the controller that's running it. Um, so that means you can upload and download any file you want. Um, usually the process on the controller is running as root or system or, you know, whatever the super user for the operating system happens to be. So you actually, because of the way the ladder logic works, you actually get free root kits because of it. And I'll talk about that. Um, and there are quite a few of these systems that are internet connected. Uh, so Aaron Leverett, who's hanging around DEF CON and giving a talk tomorrow afternoon, I would go check it out. Um, he and I did a joint paper a few years ago where we scanned the internet. This was before Shodan, like, accepted uh, third-party plugins. This is before ZMap existed. You know, we, we were running Nmap and we actually ran Unicorn Scanner um, and found a bunch of these things directly connected to the internet um, and then tried to get them removed with mixed success. Uh, so there were a couple of uh, ICS, ICS cert advisories about this. Uh, there were some CVEs issued. Both have a score of 10 because they're complete compromise of the system with, uh, you know, no, no patches, uh, et cetera. Um, so Codasys version 3 has pretty much all the same problems as version 2, um, and that gets interesting because uh, we'll look at the advisory that uh, the 3S software company put out about it. Um, the internet scan for version 3 turns out to be a little bit more complicated because they, they have a UDP version of the protocol that gets kind of tricky to scan, um, and I'll talk about that. Um, so 
uh, deployment issues. Like I said, usually when the vendors uh, put out their PLCs, they uh, run the Codasys runtime with root privileges on Linux or system privileges on Windows CE. Um, and the reason is because this, this ladder logic is actually interacting directly with hardware that's attached to the PLC. So it's usually using like GPIO. And who wants to spend the time figuring out how to do that stuff with least privilege? It's better just to you know give the process super user privileges and then it can do whatever it wants and you don't need to think about it. Um, usually to me that's a sign of rush development. Um, so the weird thing about the Codasys runtime is those ladder logic recipes that, that the uh, Codasys engineering software produces they're actually binary blobs compiled for the processor that sits in the PLC. So uh, <laughs> you get to upload them without authentication, right? So basically uh, you get to this service listens and you can upload code to it and then it will execute that code as root. Doesn't that stink? Um, because it, I mean basically like I said, you can upload a malicious ladder logic update that actually contains executable code which is uh, a rootkit for example. So to summarize the flaws, there's no security, right? Um, I think that 3S software originally assumed that um, you know, nobody would bother learning the protocol and nobody would bother attacking these systems. Um, it's kind of one of these laws though. It's like as soon as you put an ethernet port in something, it's gonna end up connected to the internet, right? So they probably should have thought about that. Um, and I don't think 3S software ever had a red team look at the product because if they did, the red team would have screamed. Um, and that'll get even more obvious when we look at the version 3 protocol, uh, especially the, the code to it. Uh, so the original vendor, the 3S software in this case, they've said, uh, well, security isn't really a, a priority of this product. That was their official announcement. They did add a username and password feature, but they're like, we don't assume that this will actually stop anyone attacking the system, so you know, protect your system some other way. <laughs> nice response. Um, so the version 2 protocol, uh, you can grab some sample scripts from our website, digitalbond.com, but the, the protocol is pretty simple, right? It starts with a couple of start bytes, uh, BBBB or CCCC or the normal ones, uses TCP 1200, uh, 2455, um, uh, and you know, figuring out the rest of the protocol is pretty easy, right? You just stare at the bytes until they make sense. You know, you're like, oh, well this four bytes is always the length and you know, this thing looks kind of like a function code because uh, normally it's one, meaning pull the status out of the thing and every once in a while when I click something in the GUI, uh, that little function code byte changes to something different. So you can kind of figure out what does what in the protocol that way. Um, yeah, I already talked about the code injection thing. So the Codasys version three protocol is kind of interesting. Um, I bought a, a PLC that runs V3 thinking like, oh, okay, well, you know, I'll learn the version 3 protocol and see what's different. And I, I did that because uh, when 3S Software released their advisory, they said, oh, version 2 is vulnerable, you know, but version 3 is not, don't worry about it, like, you're fine. Like, because I only released exploit code for version 2 and that's probably why they said version 3 is fine. The exploit code didn't work against version 3. Um, so it can use UDP or TCP. Uh, UDP limits the attack surface. Uh, TCP might. I haven't actually looked at a, a, one of the PLCs that runs TCP just because I don't have enough money to be buying that kind of stuff. They, you know, these PLCs cost usually like a thousand or two thousand dollars for a crummy little controller with no inputs, and you have to buy all kinds of equipment to support them. Um, so the version three notes that I'm going to go over, uh, I'm going to kind of talk about the protocol a bit. Uh, I'm reverse engineering the protocol, so what I say the fields are aren't necessarily what they're really called, although it is what they really do. Um, and it uses UDP 1740 or TCP 11740 as the port by default. So uh, when Codasys version 3, when the uh, engineering software first connects to the PLC, um, it sends this kind of uh, UDP SYN packet, I guess, something like that. Um, it's a really weird thing though. So it always starts with this C5730400011 uh, um, and then it has this uh, 00E6 which is actually the last octet of the IP address uh, of the, the destination that we're sending this to. So this packet was being sent to uh, the IP address 192.168.63.230. So that field 00E6 is actually uh, a word that is 230 and that's how, what they do. They put it inside of the data payload of the UDP packet, which is really weird. And they also put the uh, last octet of the IP over the source address as the next field, that purple one that says uh, 1E. 
Um, and then they have uh, CRC, which is this kind of dark purple thing down in the left-hand corner, the 6AD579F4. That's actually a CRC of the, the entire packet. Um, and then they have this random nonce, this next four-byte thing, this e E1179084. So this took a little bit more analysis to figure out what all these fields actually meant. Um, so when we sent that initial session ID, we get uh, our first reply back from the PLC. And the first reply back from the PLC, you'll notice that the source and destination fields, the 1E and E6, have changed positions because the packet is going the other way now. Um, but uh, the, we kept the same uh, session ID, that uh, 2C. The CRC obviously is updated. Um, but yeah, so that session ID that we are, yeah, sorry. When we send the first reply, we're actually sending a session ID that we ge that the PLC generates. Um, it's been a while since I've looked at this. Um, so when the, the next packet that kind of finalizes the communication, the master system has to then send that session ID as part of the payload of that next packet before it can start issuing commands. Um, and then it also has some sequence numbers. It's kind of weird. So what they're really doing is they're implementing TCP on top of UDP. So they're trying to create like some kind of uh, notion of sessions inside of this protocol, even though UDP doesn't have sessions. Um, but that's kind of in a nutshell what they're doing. The CRC algorithm was actually kind of interesting. The, so that CRC32 that I showed you, like I was reverse engineering the binary trying to figure out what CRC algorithm they were using. And I found a CRC algorithm, uh, you know, as going through code, but nothing actually called it. And I was like, well, I th think they're using CRC32. And then I wrote some code and found out, yes, they are. And then I was like, why is there no cross-reference to the CRC32 algorithm uh, that I can find, you know, where it's being called from? Because I want to find the protocol parser. Um, it turns out that there are a bunch of CRC algorithms implemented in the code, um, but only the CRC32 seemed to get used. Uh, the answer to this weird mystery turned out to be that they used uh, one of the bytes of the packet as a, as a pointer into a function pointer table to decide which CRC algorithm to apply to the packet in order to verify it. That sounds really weird, um, and it is. So basically, you accept this packet, you pull out one of the bytes, and it's, this, uh, it's the fourth byte of the packet. You compare it to hex 41, um, and then if it's less than or equal to hex 41, you use it as an index into a function pointer table, and then finally you call that index, wh whatever happened to be at that index. So um, does anybody know who here is an x86 assembly person? Anybody? What's JLE, signed or unsigned? I'll answer for you, it's signed. So uh, that value could be negative. <laughs> Think about that for a moment, right? So if the value of the, the byte in the packet is negative, and then we um, use that as an index into an array, what happens? Well, we just grab whatever happens to be sitting in memory before that array, which could be anything. And then we use that, at, we actually call that as though it's code, right? So that's pretty weird and pretty dangerous. Um, so there's, there's a lot of opportunity to exploit this in really interesting ways to do arbitrary code execution. Um, so, yeah, I, I, somebody else, I'll probably start looking at this again because I haven't dusted it off in a while. Um, but if, if somebody else wants to look, go for it. Um, it's really an interesting place to look for bugs for me. Um, and there's a lot of suggestion that other fields in the protocol, like some of the function codes, you know, take arguments and some of those arguments have weird parsers. There's some suggestion that those, those other functions of the, uh, the protocol parser work the same way. So uh, a good red team would have like, kicked and screamed and been like, what are you doing? This is crazy. But never happened, I guess. Um, so the security, anyway, of the UDP protocol is entirely reliant on that session ID. Remember, the PLC generates a session ID and sends it to the master, and then the master has to use that session ID for every request that it sends after that. Uh, the weird thing about the, the protocol in the UDP version is that those, those octets of the IP address, um, they, they actually dictate where the response is going to go to. So if you're on a di totally different subnet and you send a packet to a UDP port of one of these PLCs, the PLC will respond to the IP address that happens to have the last octet within its local subnet. So it's a really weird thing with routing. Um, so if, but if you're a hacker and you're on the local subnet, you win 100% of the time because you can see what the session ID is supposed to be. Um, however, if you're on a remote subnet, it's actually pretty easy to work around. 
Um, so the session ID is a two-byte value. So there are 65,535 possible values for that session ID. Unfortunately, they increment it by four every time. Um, so there are actually only 16,000 possible session IDs. So you can brute force that pretty quick. Um, you can just issue a connection request and then uh, slam it with, uh, with uh, stop, you know, stop op operations or stop production requests just guessing all the session IDs. It only takes 16,000 packets, which is like that on a gigabit network. Um, so Codasys version 3 is vulnerable. We wrote some internal exploit tools for it. Um, ICS cert in their original advisory, any ICS cert people in the room? Oh, thank goodness. Um, so they, in their advisory, which is still the official advisory, they say Codasys version 3.x is not affected by these vulnerabilities. Unfortunately, it is. Um, ICS cert probably got their information from 3S software. ICS cert has kind of a tendency of just taking whatever the vendor tells them and treating that as gospel rather than taking what the researcher says as gospel, unfortunately. Um, so 3S software also got it wrong. This was their official advisory. They said that their version 2.3 runtime was vulnerable. Unfortunately, their version 2.4 runtime is vulnerable and their version 3 runtime is vulnerable. Um, and another unfortunate thing is if you're an end user of one of these PLCs, you can't just patch it. You have to like go to your uh, equipment manufacturer. You have to go to ABB. You have to go to uh, you know, Mitsubishi or whoever made your PLC and have them generate you a new firmware uh, to have the fix and that takes a lot of time, unfortunately. So look at a couple of affected vendors. Um, one is that Hitachi EHV Plus line of controllers. Um, so that thing runs Codasys version three. Um, we bought an EHV uh, CPU 1025. We couldn't buy it in the United States. We actually had to buy it from a European retailer, um, which was pretty cool. Um, it only runs the UDP version of the protocol. The command line, uh, like I said, there is a kind of weird debugging command line on these things. The command line of that, that particular PLC is disabled. Uh, there might be a way to enable it via the configuration files, but we haven't figured out how to do it yet. Um, so first off, what they did right, uh, Hitachi did actually disable a lot of services on this, this particular controller. It doesn't have any open TCP ports by default. Uh, there's only one open UDP port, which is that Codasys protocol. Um, it's a lot smaller attack surface than most PLCs. A lot of PLCs have little embedded web servers that are full of vulnerabilities. They have, you know, uh, FTP servers, uh, all kinds of weird stuff with backdoors. Um, so doing a lot better than a lot of vendors. Um, on the downside, there's no way to actually update the firmware on one of these things. Um, so they're, yeah, they just don't provide any mechanism for it. I actually asked them, are they ever going to produce a firmware update? They wouldn't answer. And I was like, I noticed there is no firmware update mechanism for this in any of your software, and they wouldn't answer. Um, but that kind of stinks. Um, so to exploit the UDP version of the protocol, um, like I said, there's no security, so we just have to guess that, that SID. Um, there's, yeah, no method for ac actually adding a password to this thing via the code assist tool. Um, the exploit scripts that we wrote, we can start and stop the CPU, we can retrieve and send ladder logic to the device, we can send a new config file to the device using the directory traversal bug. Um, we can do some other weird stuff, you know, we can change the PLC's IP address and do some other goofy things. Um, and just to kind of visualize the attacking UDP thing, if you're off network, um, you just issue basically like that session initiate, the thing is going to send back the session ID to some, um, some PC on the local network and then you're just going to have to guess what the actual session ID is. Um, and that's how our tool works. Uh, another uh, vendor that's vulnerable to the, the uh, Codasys stuff is uh, Sanyo Denki. They produce a line of controllers called the Sanmotion C controller. Um, and um, they are running the Codasys version 2.3 protocol. They have VXWorks on the system. Who remembers the VXWorks debugger service? It's a really old school vulnerability. I think it's been around since 2005. Basically, it's a debug port that lets you connect and read all the memory out of a PC that's running VXWorks. Um, and then there's a couple of backdoor accounts on the system too. Um, so I didn't actually buy one of these Sanyo Denki uh, controllers. Um, I actually owned this one already. Um, they look pretty similar, right? Um, and then I was doing a little more searching because I was like, wow, that's really weird. Um, and then there's, so this is the Sanyo Denki. This is the Festo CECX controller. This is the Kaba CP232 controller. 
Um, turns out they're all the same thing. Uh, when I grabbed the firmware off the controller that I had, I just was like, well, I never bothered like looking for any vendor names in the uh, thing. You know, I just was like, oh, it's a Festo controller. I know it's a Festo controller. Sure enough, there are actually tons of vendor strings in the firmware. There's Keba, Kuka, Trump, Hitayan, Bueller, Dwyer, Engel. There's a couple of other vendors, too, that all seem to use the same hardware. Um, so they have an OEM relationship as far as hardware is concerned and firmware. Um, so that's kind of interesting. We think that the OEM for this is actually uh, Keba Automation. They're an Austrian company. Uh, just based on a lot of analysis of the firmware and uh, kind of product release dates from all the vendors. Um, so there's a ton of software components in the system though, right? There's, there's VxWorks, the operating system, there's Code Assist, the ladder logic runtime, there's the CAN open protocol stack, you know, and they have a whole bunch of other third party libraries that they've included in the firmware. Um, so it has all the problems from Code Assist version two. Um, we first contacted Festo through ICS cert in 2013. Um, Festo didn't really do anything. Um, so uh, eventually ICS cert actually gave up uh, and published an advisory without input from, from them. Uh, Festo basically refused to fix any problems. And who knows if they can, right? Because if this thing isn't even manufactured by them, uh, maybe they, their hands are tied. They might not even have access to the source code. And, uh, you know, kind of a question I have is, you know, did they contact Kaba, like upstream, their upstream provider, and say, hey, somebody reported these bugs, like, can you make a new firmware for everyone? Um, who knows? And then, of course, that makes me ask the question, do they share information about hardware defects with each other? I don't know. Wish I knew the answer to that question. Um, so, yeah, it also had the VxWorks uh, backdoor thing that was, uh, you know, there was a CVE for it back in 2005. Like I said, that's unauthenticated read write to all memory, which is really the same that thing that Code Assist lets you do, <laughs> uh, but a little bit easier because you can download tools uh, to do it from Wind River. Um, but it's important to note that um, when the PLC was released, that VxWorks CVE had been around for five years. So the, the PLC came out in 2010. Uh, that VxWorks CVE was much older than that. Um, so, yeah, of the nine total companies that were affected by that piece of hardware, <laughs> uh, that one PLC, you know, nine companies actually selling it, um, none of them spotted the security problems, right? Otherwise, they, they would have fixed it before they put it out. Um, so I don't think any of those companies do internal testing. Um, and, you know, who knows if these companies share information about um, vulnerabilities with each other. Um, so... Uh, I think I'm going to run out of time before I can do the Procono stuff too deeply. Um, so I'm going to do a not so neat deep dive and also talk about Iran. Um, so Proconos is another third party ladder logic uh, the, uh, piece of software made by another German company. Um, so these German companies seem to love this, like we take three words and put them together and capitalize and you know, do the camel case thing with their, their names. Um, uh, so uh, it's made by this uh, company called KW Software, um, but KW Software was actually bought by Phoenix Contact, and definitely go look at the ICS Village. There are tons of Phoenix Contact PLCs down there, and I will neither confirm nor deny that they're vulnerable to this issue. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the CV for this was in 2014. It also gets a score of 10 because it allows complete compromise of the controller. There's no auth authentication needed for uploading and downloading ladder logic. There's, you know, you can start and stop process control without authentication. It kind of stinks. Um, uh, see, I don't know who to attribute this quote to, but it is from Phoenix Contact slash KW Software. They're, they basically said it's up to the OEMs to, to implement security, right? We're not responsible for that. It's their job. Um, so, okay, there it is. Um, so Proconos was a little bit harder to find affected vendors for because they weren't nice in, to include a vendor list on their website. So I can't use the Internet Wayback Machine to go find a list of affected vendors. Um, we've been searching online and buying a couple of PLCs. Uh, we do know that there are some Emerson controllers out there that are affected by this, so they're a pretty big name in the industrial space. Um, Advantech is a PLC that I actually bought to play with the Proconos protocol, so we know they're affected. Um, and then there's this weird company called Contronic that I'll talk about. Um, so you can actually search for the Proconos stuff anyway on Shodan. Um, you can search for just the word Proconos and you'll find a whole bunch of controllers. There's a couple hundred, I think, right now. Um, it usually runs on port 20547. Um, anyway, on to Contronic. Um, 
I was doing this, this kind of funny thing where I was finding people's resumes in Iran just by searching for random, uh, random terms, you know? So I was like, well, I wonder if uh, anybody there is running ABB RTUs. So I'm like, ABB RTU, you know, country code dot IR. And sure enough, you find some people's resumes. And there were a bunch of people with resumes that were like, I installed this ABB RTU 560 in, you know, this weird substation in Esfahan. It's like, wow, that's cool. It's neat open source intelligence. Um, one of the things I stumbled on was this, this PLC manufacturer in Iran. And this got me really interested because I was like, wow, I don't know anything about, you know, indigenous PLC manufacturers. Uh, it's not as important now that the embargoes are all being lifted, but you know, if that had continued, I mean, Iran can't buy Siemens PLCs anymore, so they have to start making their own. What are they going to start doing? And so this was an indigenous uh, Iranian PLC made by this company called Contronic, called their PLC 500, and sure enough, it actually runs the Proconos ladder logic runtime on it um, and uses that software for configuring it. So it was just kind of neat to find a vulnerable PLC in Iran without actually being able to visit the country. Um, so uh, I was mentioning before that uh, Aaron Levert and I did some scanning of the internet. Uh, in 2014, uh, I shared a Codasys search script to uh, John Matherly, who runs Shodan, um, uh, wrote up a little script in Python to help identify Codasys systems because I was tired of, uh, of doing the searching myself. Um, you can now search for Codasys version 2 on Shodan. If you search for the word 3s hyphen smart, uh, you'll find a lot of controllers. Um, so I searched this morning and there were like 2,200 of these PLCs directly on the internet. Um, it, just for some random stats, so I, I gave a version of this talk back in June and when I gave that talk there were only 1,700 of them on the internet um, and there are actually 2,200 devices on the internet this morning. So there's actually 150 were found in the last 24 hours. So, uh, as I, you know, updated my slides for today. So that's kind of cool. Um, one of the things I found uh, that was, was kind of interesting was a ferry controller. So it was a ferry navigation and engine control system on a piece of public transportation in Europe. Um, we managed to get that taken offline, so that was fun. Um, uh, there's a lot of these controllers that are running like HVAC systems. You know, I search a lot for just like stuff in my state. I recommend if you're into this sort of thing, just give it a try, you know, like search for stuff in your local area because you'll have at least some opportunity to meet people in your area to be like, hey, you have this vulnerable thing connected to the internet and you shouldn't have it there. Let's go chat and have a coffee or something. Um, but most of these systems, we don't really know what they do, right? I find a lot of HVAC ones, I find a lot of weird small pump ones, but a lot don't have any information that you can pull out safely to, to know what they're doing. Um, so on scanning for systems, uh, so Aaron and I scanned the internet back in 2013. We found 600 of these Codasys controllers. It cost us a lot of money to do it back then because we had to rent servers and we had to like run a whole bunch of kludge together scripts and massage data. We figured out it cost about a buck fifty uh, to find uh, one vulnerable controller on the internet back then. Um, today, thanks to Shodan, I can pay $20 uh, and, and just type in a single search query and, and then I can find 2,200 of these things. So the cost to find them now is down to one cent. And the reason I mention this metric is just because, um, you know, governments now are kind of wondering what can we do to protect critical infrastructure or what can we do to uh, protect industrial systems. And I think this is one of the things that we could, or at least governments can start doing um, because it's so cheap to do, right? If you can manage a database of these systems, as vulnerabilities come out, if the system is important enough, you can like find the owner and get them to take it offline. Um, although that getting them to take it offline part is actually a little bit of a challenge. Um, so the hardest part of that whole, you know, scanning for systems is really how do you get it offline, right? I mean, these, I, you know, industrial systems are hanging on the internet and there are more and more of them being attached every day. Um, I've been doing a whole bunch of different tries at getting stuff taken down because I find a lot of weird stuff on the internet. Um, so I can say, um, most of the, the, you know, computer emergency response teams and like official government incident response teams don't have any authority to do anything. Right, most of the PLCs and industrial stuff you find is connected to just an, uh, an ISP's net block, meaning it's, it's a PLC connected to Verizon's network. Well, the government can say, hey, Verizon, can you contact the owner? But Verizon's probably gonna say no, 
Like, why would we do that? That's just more work for us. Like, and then, you know, there's liability issues that the ISPs have because they're like, well, if we do it for one person and we don't do it for somebody else, like, maybe that somebody else is going to end up suing us for doing the wrong thing. It's just liability that we don't want for whatever reason. Um, most ISPs that I've contacted, they don't do anything. I mean, they just are like, thank you for your information. We will probably never do anything with it. Um, bye. Uh, so, yeah, there's that. Uh, Every once in a while, I find a controller that has some like project information in it where it has a person's name. And usually from that, I can like figure out who they are because I control LinkedIn, I can search for that person's name, who's an industrial automation person, and find the person. And every once in a while, there's this nice success story where I'm like, hey, you have this thing attached to the internet, please take it down, and they do. Um, but it's pretty rare, unfortunately. Um, so anyway, I guess conclusions of all this, like lots of bugs in software and, you know, ICS is doomed. Um, I, I really think that, you know, the ICS vendors need to step up their game, uh, start identifying these security problems before they release products. Um, the vendors really need to do a good job of building up a list of what third-party software they're using internally. And some of them are starting to do this and others are really falling short on it. Um, but, you know, if you build up a list of third-party software you're using in your product and you're bundling with your product, then you can at least have some chance of saying when a new vulnerability comes out, okay, you know, I need to produce an updated firmware or an updated release and patch this stuff. Um, so in the San Yodenki example, you know, the controller was released in 2010 and had well-known vulnerabilities that would have been found just by running like Nessus or Nmap or whatever against the system. Um, and then in the Hitachi example, you know, Sure, the V2 code assist problems weren't released at that point, but they, you know, they're a huge company and they should have a competent red team. They really should have been red teaming this stuff back then. Um, the other thing is that these you know, control systems components never plan to patch, it seems like. You know, some of the new products that are coming out now are a little bit better, but um, you know, they really need to come up with uh, good update mechanisms, ways to manage the you know, firmware images that installed on your devices so that you know what you're running and can patch things easily. Um, and uh, yeah, design problems are still a pretty big deal uh, for the ICS space. So uh, to, to pick on Schneider Electric for a minute, um, we found a whole bunch of vulnerabilities in, in Schneider Electric PLCs uh, relating to the Modbus protocol. So their Modbus protocol has similar features to Codasys. They have a special function code called function code 90 that lets you do like ladder logic upload, download, issue these start stop commands. Um, it's kind of like their secret sauce of, of their engineering software. Um, those problems still exist in their PLCs. They've been issuing a lot of security patches for their PLCs, fixing web server vulns and like true bugs, but this is a design problem. It's a lot harder to fix and it's been, I don't know how many years now since those problems have been disclosed and there still aren't fixes for them. Um, and then, you know, in the 3S software example, they fixed directory traversal vulnerabilities really quick because that's a real bug. But again, the design issue of, you know, not having authentication is going to take them a lot longer. So that's all I have. Um, any questions, comments? tomatoes. Go check out the ICS Village if you haven't. Uh, definitely do. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of Phoenix Contact PLCs to look at. So, yeah. Yeah, the question was, uh, like, what's, what's my rate of uh, kind of vendors saying that's not a vulnerability where I say that it is? Um, it actually hasn't been that high. Um, it, you know, when contacting, when, when getting in touch with vendors directly, a lot of them will be like, yeah, that is a security problem. I'd say the, the real challenge is, like, the, the kind of 3S software response and even the KW software response was both, yes, that's a security problem, but that's not our job. <laughs> Uh, like, it's not our job to fix that, uh, you know, it's up to the OEM to fix it or the end user to deal with it. Uh, I'd say that's a much more common issue. Any others? Okay, thanks. <laughs>